All right, welcome back party people. So today I have a video that may help you if you are a Google Fiber subscriber or even if you're experiencing challenges in your network due to double NAT. <laughs> So if you were an early subscriber to Google Fiber, it's likely that you received a network box that looks similar to that in the top left corner of your video screen. Now this network box provides access to the internet for both your wired and wireless clients in your home. If you're a newer subscriber of Google Fiber, you no longer receive this network box. You receive a Google Wi-Fi mesh system and the Google Wi-Fi primary router connects directly to the fiber jack providing access to the internet for both wired and wireless users. So the graphic on the screen represents a network similar to that in my home, which is a true brownfield scenario. In network engineering, a brownfield scenario is when you have an existing network and you try to integrate either another network, a new system, a new component, new features, and there are some artificial boundaries usually created by the different technologies, and this can create some challenges. And if you're like me, for your home network, you want it to be simple and secure and to just function. You don't want to have to waste a lot of time administering network components. So the purpose of today's video is going to show you how to convert the older style Google Fiber that included the network box and transform it into the newer style Google Fiber, which includes the Google Wi-Fi mesh system. OK, so let's jump into the details here. I'm going to use some very archaic markup here, so uh, excuse me, but this is what I have available currently. Now you can see that our Google network box is located here. And so my existing network was this 192.168.100 with a 24 a network mask here. So this box was providing both the Wi-Fi and the wired users access to the internet in the home. And as time went on, I ended up expanding my Wi-Fi service within the house and adding additional technologies. And the easiest way was really just to build out this separate network here and just connect it into the existing network. And so this is our new network. So let's ask ourselves a real question here. Why would I want to move to the new style? Is there any advantage of me doing that. And for me, it's really threefold. Number one, the Wi-Fi on this particular network box that I received from Google Fiber, the Wi-Fi signal degrades significantly as you move away from this box, more so than other Wi-Fi boxes that, that I've had experience with. And so what I wanted to do was provide a better Wi-Fi signal up in this part of the house for my uh, home users. That was number one. Number two, if you uh, can remove a network component that's you know uh, less power, less heat dissipated, and ultimately you know that's that's cost savings in the long in the long run. And then number three, there's some connectivity challenges between these two networks here that are brought upon by having a double NATed network. What type of connectivity challenges are we talking about here? First, I think it's important to understand two concepts. Number one, NAT. Number two, port forwarding. Once we understand these two concepts, then we can start to dissect our network and understand those connectivity challenges. So let's get to it. So NAT is essentially a function that runs on the router that enables private networks with non-unique IP addresses to connect to the internet. And it does this by essentially translating the non-unique internal IP addresses to a unique global address, which is routable on the internet. So what does that really mean? So let's take an example. So if we have a user here, let's say, He's on the 192.168.100 network and his IP address is 192.168.100.5. Now, if he wants to communicate to the internet, he's going to send his request. The NAT function on this router is going to look at his internal IP address and essentially replace the source IP address of his packets with this external globally routed address here. And that ensures communication to the internet and 
in response to those packets coming internal, the NAT function is going to look at any previously established outbound connections and match those in its tables and then allow the return packets to map to their destination. So that is essentially how NAT functions. Remember these addresses here are RFC 1918 addresses and they are not unique. There's no way the internet would know how to route to these addresses if they existed in multiple places, so to speak. Suppose I'm a user up here on the internet and I want to view my security cam footage down here on this internal non-unique IP address, which we know can't be routed over the internet. So there has to be some functionality to help us get to this security cam footage. And that's where port forwarding comes into play here. So basically what we wanna do now is create a rule within our gateway that says, if you connect to this outside address here that is globally unique and connect to the service on port 80, we're gonna translate that to the IP address of the security camera, TCP port 80. Now you can have different ports and you can map those in your port forwarding tables. This is what port forwarding allows you to do. So those are two important functions. NAT allows all of these non-unique IP addresses to share this one globally unique address, thereby allowing connectivity for all of these devices to the internet. Port forwarding allows inbound communication. So for example, if we are a user on the internet and we wanna access some security cam footage. We create port forwarding rules in our router to specify if we connect to this address on a certain port, i.e. port 80, then we know to forward that to this security camera on port 80. And that's just one example. The two different functions here but both important nonetheless. If we look at a snapshot of a network that's similar to my home network, what we see here is we have two NAT routers in our network. So the primary router node of the Google Wi-Fi mesh system is a NAT router, and the Google Fiber network box is also a NAT router. All right, and so this network is deemed to be double NATed. So that means there is one NAT translation occurring here in the primary router node of the Google Wi-Fi mesh and a second NAT translation is occurring at the access gateway here which is the network box for Google Fiber. Now in itself that's really not a challenge however it can present challenges and one of the challenges that I have is connectivity between my private networks here. Now let's take an example of communication between these networks. Now let's say I'm a user here and I want to connect and print to this printer down here. Remember what we learned about NAT and remember what we learned about port forwarding. Remember NAT has a deny for any incoming connections that don't already match an outgoing request. So for example, if we tried to send a request to this printer, this NAT router here, our primary router of the Google Wi-Fi mesh is gonna look into its NAT tables and it's not gonna match an existing outgoing connection and it's going to deny the connectivity. And therefore, user here is probably gonna throw some expletives and say, I can't print. And that's just the beginning of it. For any new service that you're trying to access from this network over here, you're not gonna be able to communicate with. Now, how do we effectively manage that? Remember, we talked about PAT and port forwarding. So port forwarding is kind of a specific function of port address translation or PAT. Now, for every service that you wanna access on this network here, you're gonna need port forwarding tables. All right, let's say that our printer is 
on port five is, is listening on port five thousand. So in this port forwarding table, now you would create a rule that says any income connections that are destined for a particular port map those over to this printer and port number. Now you could choose a totally different port on the outside here. I could choose a port of eight eight thousand. And say if you make a connectivity to this outside interface here, so it's going to be one of these 192, 168, 100 addresses. In my case, it's, it's, it's uh, dot six. So any connection that comes into this router on the outside interface, dot six, destined for port for TCP port 8000, translate that into the IP address of this printer and destination port, TCP port of 5000. And those port forwarding rules are going to allow you to have that two-way communication. Now, any other services that you turn up, for example, let's say you had a web server down here running on port 80. Now, if this user wants to create, wants to connect to the web server, well, now you're going to have to create another port forwarding rule that says any income connection on port 80 to this outside address here, we're going to say we're going to send that to our web server down here on TCP port 80. So that's effectively what port forwarding allows you to do. So now you can start to see the complexity. For every service you turn up down here, you're going to have to have a port forwarding rule in this NAT router. Now, as I'm sure most of you want to do, you probably want to connect from externally up here to something on your internal network for example let's say you had a file server or for example if you have a security camera that you want to view from the outside well now you also have to have port forwarding rules in the other NAT router as well because they are traversing now through the access gateway to the internet you're going to have to sit you're going to have to create the port forwarding mapping of the external connection and send that to internal. So now you have port forwarding rules in two devices. They're growing twice for every service that you turn up and you're gonna to have to manage both of those devices and manage all of those port forwarding rules. And so that's why the complexity of this thing can kind of become a little more than you really want in a home network. So what we really wanna do is now remove one of these NAT routers and now, get us a direct connection to our fiber jack. And so now we only have one NAT router in our network that will simplify communications and connectivity here. Let's take a look at a before with a double NAT and an after with a single NAT and go through the examples we did before and see how they behave. All right, so this is our before network. And remember we had that router here, that router. That is our double natted network. And what we're trying to move to is a single natted network. So this is our after network and as we can see here, this is a single NATed network. We have one NAT translation going on down here at the primary router of our Google Wi-Fi mesh. Remember the complexities that we had with the double NAT here, specifically having to port forward in two different routers here because of connectivity issues. And now let's take a look at the after so notice here, we have no longer have our Google network box. Now we are connecting our Wi-Fi primary node directly to the fiber jack that is being provided by Google Fiber. Talk a little bit about this switch here in a minute, but just for now, just imagine that it's not even there. And now we have this single NATed network and we have all of our devices now one private internal network and they can communicate to each other 
bidirectionally with no problems whatsoever because they are on the same LAN network here. All right, so that's a comparison of the before and the after. Now, in order to do this conversion, there are a few things that you need to be aware of. Number one, cabling. I'm just going to scribble this up here. I'm doing this with a mouse, so it's pretty, pretty, pretty unstable. So you want to make sure that this network of users are now able to physically take advantage of your Google Wi-Fi mesh system, right? So remember, this our, our aim is to remove this network box here. So we're no longer going to have this other private network here. So those users need to be able to either get on the Google Wi-Fi or if you have wired users, make sure the cabling is to a switch that is on the network port of the one of the Google Wi-Fi pucks. Number two, you're going to want to make sure that you have some way to power this fiber jack. And there was three options. One is you can request a power adapter from Google Fiber, plug that into a standard wall outlet and plug it into your fiber jack and it'll provide power. Number two, you could use a PoE injector. Number three, you could use a power over the ethernet capable uh, switch port. One thing I mentioned briefly previously was the existence of this switch here. And this switch was actually uh, an extraneous switch that I had laying around that was 802.3 AF compliant, meaning it could provide power over Ethernet. And I inserted it in between the primary router node of the Google Wi Fi mesh and the fiber jack in order to power this fiber jack. It was just easier for me to just use what I had laying around. The one thing you don't want to do is go blindly unplug the link from the, your old network box and just plug it directly into the Google Wi-Fi primary node because it does not support PoE and your link, your Ethernet link will not come up between those and therefore you'll be denying internet access to all the users in your home. Number three, you want to make sure that any port forwarding rules that you had or any advanced features that you were using in the Google network box are replicated into the new gateway. And for me, there was some special port forwarding rules I've, I had in there for accessing web servers from the outside internet, security cameras and things like that. So port forwarding rules. Number four, was to make sure that you request request that now you move to your own router. And that just lets Google know that you're providing your own service. All right, so that is how you convert from the old style Google Fiber to either using your own router or converting to the new style Google Fiber that uses Google Wi-Fi. As you can see in our network diagram here now, we have a more simplified network and we have less administrative tasks specifically around keeping up with our port forwarding rules in multiple routers and also with communication issues between two private internal networks. That's going to wrap this video up. I hope you found this information useful. Till next time, skill up and ride, van up and go, and just remember, everybody needs a plan B. Cha-cha for now.